with me because I'm sharing something that I believe that is very important that you need to hear right now. Thank you all for rejoining. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you so much. Yes. All right, here we go. Yeah, so imagine <laughs> you go to bed, you're minding your own business, and you're thrust into a dream, and God is speaking to you about a race of people on the earth that happen to have dark colored skin. That was my experience. Like straight up, no cap. That was my experience. And God said to me in the dream, he said, the devil fears you, meaning the black race. Why? Because in the days of the intensification of spiritual warfare, he said, I'm going to call for a particular people to come before me with a particular gift. He says, that's when Africa will rise and create prayer cover for the move of my spirit in the earth. Some of these things I'm saying may be foreign to some of you, but this has been my experience. And as a result of it, I followed that through and I wrote a book entitled The Destiny of the Black Race since 1990. I took the book out of circulation when I went to Kenya in 2012. I had an encounter that made me know that it had become more relevant to our generation than ever before. And so I actually went and I revised it. And I will be putting it back out into print because it is important that we know what's going on around us and why people are being targeted. To me, it's more of a spiritual thing than it is a color thing, but the color thing helps. It works for the enemy to keep us divided. That's what society has become. One big division, people falling into tribes, whether it's political or, or even biological or whatever the case may be. So there is something happening in our world right now, people. And if we don't wake up, we're going to wake up one morning and find that we have literally become, you know, the people who are part of this, you know, a, a, like almost like a, a sci-fi type movie or fantasy movie like the island in which people no longer can speak, have a mind of their own. And this whole idea of free speech, it is becoming more and more of a farce. But I can tell you one thing that the powers that be, the evil empire fear. And it's called the masses of people coming together. Whether they be black, white, blue, brown with yellow polka dots, that's not the issue. The real issue is that they fear when we come together and we speak together and we have a mind of our own. All people are beautiful because below the skin we are created in the image of God. And we need to understand that. Love is not something we should barter and trade on the internet. Internet trolls. Some of you are responsible for people taking their lives. And your trophy is that one day you're going to realize you've just been used. Because of your own pain, you project that onto other people. You allow yourself to be used because somehow it gives your life some form of meaning or existence. It's time to stop that. It's time to really examine our lives. And ask ourselves if we really want to be a tool for love or a tool for hate. We can't continue down that pathway. It's not benefiting us. It's not helping us. And as long as we remain divided, we're so easy for the systems of this world to control. That's the thing they fear more than anything at all. Some years ago, a bunch of scientists, well, the experiment or the science, the... Un the, 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 the um, the looking into the science of what is called epigenetics. That started back in 1942, by the way. And they began to realize that not only each of us are unique by DNA, but there is something inside of our DNA that is called an epigenetic coding. Hear me right now. Please hear me. It's called an epigenetic coding. And it really, it's like computer hardware and computer software. 
Computer hardware is tangible. You can touch it. You can touch it. You can feel it. Computer software is more intangible. You don't actually, you don't touch it. It's coding, it's writings, it's letters. And, you know, I'm not a computer uh, 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 nerd. So, you know, I'm not going to try to go too far out of my own comfort zone on that. But what they discovered is that your experiences in life write a certain coding. And if you have had traumatic experiences, fearful experiences, it's almost like it is encoded in you. And they started to do an experiment. They put a bunch of mice, lab mice, into cages. And they outfitted them with electrodes. And they put cherry blossoms in the cage. And every time one of these little mice would go close to the cherry blossom to sniff it like that, they would shock the little creature. So after a while, it began to associate this shocking treatment with being, um, with, with, with smelling or going close to the cherry blossoms. So after a while, they didn't have to administer the shock treatment anymore. The little mice would begin to back up and recoil every time it would see a cherry blossom. But listen to me, people, that was not the real kicker. That was not the real uh, uh, extent of the experiment. What they found is that the mice that were born to the ones that went through this, also, anytime they got close to cherry blossoms, they would back up. They would not go close to the cherry blossoms. Oh my God. They were fearful of the cherry blossoms and they were the next generation. And then the next generation after that took that on. They actually started such experiments to find out if sicknesses and disease can actually be transferred generationally. And what they discovered out of that led to other experiments like the Tuskegee Airmen experiment. And they began to realize that the traumatic experiences of slavery and colonization had a negative impact on blacks. That is why today we have neighborhoods, ghetto communities in various cities around America where people are herded into and because of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, we end up hating one another, we end up killing one another. And the powers that be, they know this. Boys in the Hood was not really that far-fetched. Boys in the Hood was not really that far-fetched. You remember Lawrence Fishburne speaking to, was it Cuba Gooden Jr., his son in the movie, and telling him why there is a, a liquor store and a gun shop close to each other in these uh, communities of color. I'm here to tell you tonight that we have sat back for too long and allowed ourselves to be programmed by people who are depending on us to cause our own extinction. Every time you go after each other on the internet, you are feeding into that narrative. Every time you tear each other down, you are feeding into that narrative. And so and it's very easy for us when one of ours gets caught up. Whether for right or wrong, we are ready. We are instantaneously ready to pounce on that one that, one that becomes weaker because we fear our own demise, not knowing that we actually have the power on the inside of us that could change the narrative and help one another and build better communities rather than allowing ourselves to continue that age-old lie. So it's time to, to stand up. And I'm going to wind this down tonight. My purpose for coming on here, like I said, and I didn't even go into a lot of what I could have gone into. I want you to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, I continue to fight and I will stand up for the justice that needs to be done on behalf of my son or any other human being that God places me in their lives to be able to be a voice for them as long as I have breath in this body. And it is only God that can determine how long I will have breath in this body.
I didn't even get to tell you tonight, and this will be the last testimony for now concerning him, and then I will close off with a talk that I want to leave with you. I didn't even tell you that over a year ago, my son called me up on the phone and he said, Dad, someone introduced me to a young man. His name was Kirshner, who is in the industry. He's a producer and he does various things in the record industry. This kid was shot eight times, shot eight times and was left for dead. He was in the hospital and they start prayed with this young man and spoke to him prophetically and told him that God was not going to allow him to die. Told him that God would actually bring him through it. Then he called me after praying for the young man and said, Dad, thus and such is the situation. Let's pray for this kid. And I stood together with him. We were in two different cities and I stood together with him and we prayed for this, child, for this, this young man. Recently, and again, this is something he won't say, so I have to say it tonight. This guy that they're trying to make you believe is some monster that would just shoot somebody because of an argument that said, oh, my career is better than yours. I mean, do, 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 do they think that we are stupid when this was happening in a time when the name Tory Lanez was the biggest, most recognized name on planet Earth during COVID? Not only by celebrities in America, but football players who are the rock stars of England and Europe were tuning into that thing. Recently, some people who were concerned started to raise money on behalf of Daystar, he didn't ask them to do it, but they started to raise money and somehow the word got back to this young man. I've never spoken to him in person. Daystar did not speak to him from his cell, but that young man, when he heard about it and heard that at that point they had raised a certain amount of money, he said to them, Keep that money in your pocket. I am going to put up $250,000 for his defense. And he does not have to pay me back one single penny. Because of him today, I'm alive. And because of him, I have now become a millionaire, multi-millionaire in the, in, in the industry. I'm having two Lamborghinis and this and that and that because of him. And I'm ready to do this. He does not have to pay me anything. He doesn't have to pay me back anything. You tell me who does that for somebody who is so cold and callous that they would just up and shoot some young woman just like that. That's a lie. And the devil is the father of lies and of liars. So as I close this tonight, I do want to say to all of us that we are living at a time that I could take you back three, four thousand years ago to the story of a young boy whose name was David, who was a shepherd, who actually wrote about 98% of the Psalms in the Bible. David, a singer of songs. David, a rapper of rhymes, if you will. I want to take you back to the fact that at some point in his life, he walked into a situation because all of his brothers had gone out to war. The battle was against a group of people called the Philistines from Philistia and the Israelites from Israel. His father sent him to the battle site one day in order to take lunch for his brothers. As he got there, he saw a giant who was described as being 10 feet tall. The air we breathe today don't allow people to grow that big, but trust me, in those days, yeah, they could. 
A giant was 10 feet tall. His spear was nine feet long. And it is said that the man was a machine of war, if you will, from the time he was a, a youth. David got there just in time to hear this man standing up and standing up and roaring across the valley, send me a man, let us fight together. We don't need to have all of these two armies go to battle, send me a man, let's fight. And if he defeats me, we will become your servants, but if I defeat him, you will become our slaves. That's exactly the narrative. David saw that the whole army of Israel were afraid of this giant. Nobody wanted to go face him. When he inquired, somebody said, the king has said that if anybody can fight this guy, yo, I'm going to make his family free from taxation in Israel and he can marry my daughter. That's how desperate the king was. David said, what? Are you kidding me? That's what the king will do? He said, that's wonderful, but I'll kill this guy for free. David was a 15, 16 year old young man at the time. So much that when he went to the king, when they brought him to the king and said, this is what this young man is saying. The king said, what? He said, you know what? I'm a shepherd. I've been, I've been minding my father's sheep before and a bear came and, and I killed the bear. A lion came, I killed the lion. And this Philistine who has no covenant with God will be just like one of them. Somehow the king saw strength and faith and courage in this, in this kid. And he said, okay, I'm not going to go through all the details, but we know how it went. Here's something you need to understand. And let me bring it into today's terminology as we're closing this down tonight. Here's what you need to understand. The Philistines comprised of five kingdoms, five kingdoms. Each had its own king, but they moved together as one unit. They had a large army. Their chariots were made of iron. The Israelites had inferior weapons to them at the time. On top of that, this was the machine, this was the evil empire that had invested all of their strength into this one giant because it was a strategic move to end the war like that. David happened to be there on that day and he learned that for the past 40 days, this giant had been standing up and saying the same message and Israel had no message of their own. It is unfortunate, but I feel like for the past two and a half years, we have stood by as they gagged my son from being able to say anything on his own behalf and spun this narrative. And if it were in today's time, this is how it would look. The Philistines had taken out ad buys, ad buys on every major station so that any program you would turn on throughout the day you would hear at least 15 to 20 commercials coming from this giant on every network that it could go out on, not to mention the internet. And in all of this, the Philistines had no message. They had nothing to say. Sorry, the, the Israelites had no message. In so much that by the 40th day when David showed up, the men of Israel were now saying what the giant is saying. This is what the giant has been saying. And they were rehearsing his message because they had no message of their own. How long are we going to stand back and have no message, have nothing to say while people destroy our sons and our daughters? How long? When I was in Kenya in 2012, I was moved to revise the book because I had come to the place where I knew it was going to be more relevant than ever before. Remember, that book was first written in 1990. Now we are in 2011. And I'm being stirred in my heart to revise the book because it's now become more relevant than ever before. It was two months after that Trayvon Martin situation happened. 
followed by a bunch of other situations being caught on cell phones. It's been happening for a long time. But only now, the situation was it was being captured in real time and sometimes exported out in real time. The powers that be, the evil empire, hashtag evil empire, has had us tripping over each other for so long and so fearful and so held in a corner that we are fearful to speak against injustice when we see it. We would rather turn on our own. There are certain bloggers out here who, you know, I, 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 in some ways I sympathize with you because in fact, Tory himself said it. If in fact that he had done this, he would feel like he should bear the wrath of all of that. He should be called this and he should be called that. But he did not do this, people. He did not do this. We've been up one side and down the other about it. But come to realize there are so many more people than him. So many people out here who through the years of Jim Crowism and all manner of divisiveness, scientific experiments being done on our people. We have people who are now in prison, many cases wrongfully, so we can continue to feed the beast that is called the prison industrial complex. And once they are locked away, many of them do not have the notoriety of a Tory Lanes. So people forget about them. Many of them are incarcerated wrongly. We have a system that is willing to lie and bend the truth. A system that is ready to obscure, obscure evidence that can actually prove a man's innocence because it is more important that we fill the columns of L's and W's. Win, W's and L's, wins and losses. That's what it's all about. To some of them it's a game. People like that have no conscience. Their, their, their conscience is no longer there. Don't try to think that they will have a conscience because the only person that can change that is Almighty God. But I want you to know, dear people, God is not trying to make us look at each other in terms of black and white and blah, blah, blah.